we usually don't do this except on Easter, but he's risen. He's risen? Amen. I, I was just pointing out to Noah the book Tortured for Christ back there on the shelf by Richard Vermbron. He was a pastor in prison in Romania during the communist times, and he said that there was a time when one of the communist officials came to one of the churches and he spent hours explaining why belief in God was ridiculous and silly and foolish and reason after reason and evidence after evidence. And he pointed to the pastor and said, there, what are you going to do with that? And the pastor walked up on the stage and said, he's risen. And everyone in the church stood up and shouted, he's risen indeed. He is. When I was growing up, the army recruiting commercial slogan was be all that you can be do you guys remember that there's even a little song that goes with it but i won't sing it today by the t- i think it maybe when i was a teenager or maybe in college they changed the slogan for a little bit and the slogan was do you remember that one an army of an army of one yes and a lot of people criticized the slogan because being in the military was supposed to be at unity and cohesion and working together, but here we're seeing the army of one. So it was kind of trying to appeal to more individualistic young people. It's not just the army, and it's not just young people, though, that suffer from excessive individuality in our day. How many times have you heard something like, I'm spiritual, but I just don't believe in organized religion? Heard that one? Well, Christianity is an organized religion, and in fact, Christianity, our faith, cannot be practiced fully apart from other believers. An important part of the spiritual life that God describes in the Bible is something the Greeks called koinonia, which means a lot of different things. It means communion. It's the word that we use for communion here. It also means sharing something together. Like when the church gathered together some money and some food for the churches that were struggling, they called it koinonia. But it also means our common everyday English word, fellowship. So biblical fellowship is a certain kind of life of believers together, and it's essential to the Christian faith. And it means more than just hanging out and spending time together. Quinonia, it's a relationship, a meaningful relationship in which we're encouraged, we're comforted, we're loved. Good things, right? It's a relationship in which we fail. If you're in a church long enough, if you're in fellowship long enough, you will offend someone and someone will offend you. But it's also a relationship in which we forgive. And it's a relationship that pushes us closer to Christ. I think that these days with the Instagram and the Facebook and the Snapchat, things that aren't inherently bad, we have more opportunities for relationships than any time in human history. But we have a desperate lack of fellowship. So today I'm going to talk about, if you want to take notes, there'll be three and three. I'm going to talk about three reasons why we need fellowship, why that's important and what it looks like. And I'm going to talk about three principles to guide us in finding fellowship. So the first purpose or the first reason I'm going to talk about for fellowship is that biblical godly fellowship models God's relational love to the world. In other words, it shows the world what God's love looks like. The scriptures teach us that there's one God and that he exists eternally as three persons. He didn't start as one person, become another. He doesn't change from father to son on day to day. They're not just different faces of God. He didn't make himself into multiple persons. It's his eternal nature. He was always three persons, and he always will be. As Christ himself said when he prayed to the Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. So, Christ Jesus didn't come to exist in Bethlehem that day. He didn't come to exist nine months before. He is eternally existent. And in John 1, 1, the Apostle John writes, in the beginning was the word, which refers to Jesus. Thank you. And the word was with God, and the word was God. So the three persons of the Trinity have fellowship with other, each other, perfect fellowship. So the Father, God the Father, loves the Son. You remember he says in Matthew, A voice from heaven says, this is my son whom I love. 
with him I am well pleased. The son, Jesus, honors and obeys the father. He said, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And the Holy Spirit brings glory to the father and the son. Now, sometimes we get sucked into thinking of the Holy Spirit as kind of a force, but the scripture always refers to him as a he. He's a person. And said, Jesus said, when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. So within the Godhead, the three persons of the Trinity are in perfect relationship and fellowship with each other. But not just with each other. The three persons of the Trinity are in fellowship with us, too. In 2 Corinthians, Paul writes, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son, the love of God, the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So God is a relational being. He's relational within himself. And the reason why he created us was to know him and have relationships with him. So when we have biblical fellowship with other Christians, we're modeling for the lost world what God's love looks like. Marriage is another form of this kind of relationship. In a husband and wife relationship, when it's the way it's supposed to be, God gives us opportunities to love, to honor, protect, to communicate, to forgive, and to be forgiven. So when we're in godly relationships with other people, we're doing those things as well. We're engaging in being and becoming the creatures that God created us to be. And we're modeling those relationships before the world. Do you guys know the song, uh, They'll Know We Are Christians? Because we're one in the Spirit, we're one in the Lord. We pray that all unity may one day be restored. We'll walk with each other, we'll walk hand in hand. Together we'll spread the news that God is in our land. And they'll know we are Christians by our, by our love. They'll know we're Christians by our love. So when we fellowship with each other, not just hanging out, but real biblical fellowship, we're modeling God's love in front of a lost world. A second purpose for biblical fellowship is to do the work of the church. Some things that God has told us to do, we can't do on our own. Not because we're not good enough, but because they require other believers. Baptism. You can't baptize yourself. You can't go off in a corner and baptize yourself because it's something we do in front of people. You can't pray together by yourself. You can't give to other people alone. You can't take communion alone. So it's clear that God created each of us to be in communion with other believers. Have you heard the expression, there are no Lone Ranger Christians? Yes, I, I, I looked on the internet and I find it quoted so many times, but I can't for the life of me find out who said it first. It can't predate the show, The Lone Ranger, though, can it? When I was a kid, I thought it was The Long Ranger, and I wasn't sure what that meant. So we say there are no Lone Ranger Christians to mean that there shouldn't be, but in fact, there are. There are, are lots of Lone Ranger Christians. When we say there are no Lone Ranger Christians, we don't mean that if you're not connected to a church or not in fellowship that you can't be saved and go to heaven. But apart from the church and apart from fellowship, you can't be who God created you to be. In 1 Corinthians 12, Paul writes, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in every one, every one, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. So God is not working through me. I hope he is, but he's not working through just me or just Ed and Abby when they're leading us in worship or the gentlemen who lead the church or the ladies who uh, coordinate Bible study. He's not just working through those people. He is at work in every single member of the church. And for that work to happen, for the things to happen that God wants to happen, you have to be here. I have to be here. We have to be together. It requires living together. 
So yeah, it's possible for someone to say, I'm a Christian, but I don't belong to a church. Just the same way it's possible to say, I have a car, but it only has two wheels. It's still a car, but it's not going to do the things that it was created to do. And I'm sure everybody here in church probably agrees with that because you're here. So God wants us to be a part of a church, sure. But there are a lot of Christians living together, living today, who attend church regularly, but without any kind of meaningful fellowship. In Colossians chapter 3, Paul writes, Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. How can we forgive each other if we make certain that no one ever, ever knows what our sins are? Yes, I'm a sinner, but make sure that no one knows what any of my sins are. Greek has one word that means the English two words, one another. It's alelon. It just means to each other. And the word appears again and again and again in the New Testament because we're instructed to do things to one another. John 13 says that we should love one another. Romans 14 says that we should edify one another, like teach, like give each other advice and wisdom, godly wisdom. We should admonish one another, Romans 15. That means sometimes we, sometimes I, sometimes you need somebody to tell us, hey, stop doing that. Or that thing you're supposed to be doing that you're not, start doing it. Serve one another, Galatians 5. Comfort one another, 1 Thessalonians 4. Bear each other's burdens, Galatians 6. How can we do any of these things if we don't have any genuine relationships with other Christians? How can the world see God's power at work if they never know the things that God is doing in our lives? How can somebody give glory and thank God for the amazing thing he did in my life if I never ever let any of you know that I was having a problem to start with? Paul wasn't afraid to talk about his weaknesses. And by weaknesses, we don't just mean uh, struggles or physical ailments. When he wrote to his young protege, Timothy, he said he had a trustworthy saying, like a proverb. He said, it's true. He said, Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the, the worst. That was Paul. He said, Christ died to save sinners of whom I'm the worst. And he wasn't just being hyperbolic. He wasn't just saying, poor, terrible me. Gosh, I'm so bad. In my Christian life, and I think this is true of you as well, the longer I've known Christ, the more wretched I realize that I am. Uh, even as sometimes I stop doing out certain outward sins, I recognize just how proud I am, just how self-centered I am, and, and that sense grows. And it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing because it allows us to share more deeply in the grace that God has for us. So as we grow to know our failings, we know that in our heads. We know it in our hearts. If we can be honest with ourselves that, yes, we're sinners— why shouldn't we be willing to share it with our fellow sinners? Paul was unafraid to talk about that. In 2 Corinthians 11, he said, Who is weak and I do not feel weak? Who is led into sin and I do not inwardly burn? If I must boast, I will boast about the things that show my weaknesses. So he was not afraid to be honest and open and transparent about these things. So we should be in fellowship because it allows glory to come to God for the things that he does for us. Do you remember when Jesus healed the leper and he told the leper, don't go around telling people? Kind of a weird thing it seemed for Jesus to do. It was kind of early on in his ministry and he was trying to do things but kind of keep it on the hush for a little bit. And he told him, don't go telling people what I did. Instead, I want you to go to the priests because there was a law in the law of Moses that said, if you're cleansed of leprosy, you should go and offer such and such sacrifice. Marion could probably tell you what sacrifice off the top of his head. I don't remember which one it was, but he said, go and offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving. So he said, I want you to go to the priests and tell them what happened. 
and offer the sacrifice that Moses prescribed. Why did Jesus do that? Well, I think one of the reasons he did that was a, not for the guy himself, but as a testimony to the priests so they could see what this bad thing was and how Jesus had made it right. It gave them an opportunity to give glory to God. Now, maybe they would, maybe they wouldn't have taken it, but it gave them that opportunity. So we need to do the same. We need to be bold enough to give the opportunity for glory to come to God for the things that he's doing in our lives. But we have to be willing to be vulnerable to share those things before they're fixed, before they're fixed. We can be comfort, not comp, <laughs> not comfortable, but we can be confident doing this because the weaknesses that we share with each other, we share with each other. What I mean is the weaknesses that we tell each other about, that we share with each other to bear each other's burdens, we share those same weaknesses. You know, the scripture says that none of us are tempted by things except what's common to man. If you have a large enough group and you share something you're struggling with, chances are good there's someone else there who has either struggled with it or is struggling with it now or is going to struggle with it someday. So fellowship includes being around people who are good examples to us, people who encourage us by their words or their mere presence to be godly. Jesus said, you know, we're in the world, but not of it. And if we stay in the world and out of fellowship long enough, we start to become more and more of the world. Proverbs 13, 20 says, walk with the wise and become wise for a companion of fools suffers harm. And 1 Corinthians, a lot of 1 Corinthians today. Chapter 15, verse 33, Paul says, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. So Christ wants us to be in the world. He wants us to be among sinners and in relationship with sinners. But to do that and not become like them, we have to have good fellowship. So we can't do the work of Christ if we're not in a church, but we can't do it either if we're in a church, come to a church regularly, but we don't have genuine fellowship with other members of the body. So that second reason is we need fellowship because you can't have the Christian life apart from it. You can't do the things God has asked you to do or be the person God wants you to be apart from genuine relationships. A third reason for genuine biblical fellowship is fellowship with one another creates fellowship with Christ himself. So we know we're supposed to stay close to Jesus, right? You know, the I'm the vine, you're the branches. If anyone remains in me and I remain in him, we know that. We've heard it enough that we know. It. We don't always do it, but we know that it's true, that we need to stay close to Jesus. But we can't say, I'm going to have fellowship with Christ, but not with my fellow believers. Again, I don't mean that someone who isn't in a church isn't a Christian, but someone who isn't connected to the church, someone who isn't in godly fellowship is not living as a Christian. So our fellowship is with Christ, but not with Christ alone, but with the saints with whom we'll be spending eternity. So should we wait until eternity begins before we start having that fellowship? That's like saying, I'm saved now, but I'm going to wait till Jesus comes to work on my prayer life, or uh, I'm not going to worship until I get to heaven. Those are parts of the Christian life that begin now. This morning, we took communion. Quinonia. Communion is participation or sharing. It's relationship made into action with Christ, with God the Father, with the Holy Spirit, but also with our fellow brothers and sisters. Outside the sacrament of communion, when we have godly fellowship with each other, we are still participating in the communion with Christ. When we engage in the life and the purpose of the body of Christ, and fellowship is one of those purposes, we're engaged with Christ himself. So, you remember when Jesus said, wherever two or three are gathered together, that I'm there? 
You remember he said when he comes at the end of time and he's judging the world and people come and he said, when I was hungry, when I was in prison, you visited me. When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. And he said, well, when did I do those things? And he said, when you did that unto the least of these, my brothers, you were doing it unto me. So when we share God's love with each other, when we bear each other's burdens, when we pray for each other, when we spend time together, we're doing the same for Christ. It's fellowship with him as well. So do you believe me that it's important? Okay, I can skip over point five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. then. All right. I want to talk very briefly now about three principles about how to get into godly fellowship. And they're not going to be go sm- start a small group or make sure you have X number of friends or things like that. There are, I'm sure, lots of good things that we can do to get into relationships with people. But I'm going to talk about kind of something a little bit different. The first thing I want to say about getting into godly fellowship, if you're not, or if you want more, is that godly fellowship doesn't happen by accident. Don't just sit around and wait and hope that it happens. We should be actively looking for people who want to go beyond social pleasantries. The hi, how are yous? How are you doing? Fine. You know, those are good things. Social pleasantries aren't bad, but they're only the first step of genuine relationships. Uh, you, a lot of you know I teach English to international students, and one of the things that we teach is like the, the hi, how are you? role you've probably done that if you've studied another language like hola como estas that kind of thing Uh, yes all right you're all familiar with that well we teach that in english too and so we teach everybody to say hi how are you and the answer is good or fine one of those two or okay are, are usually the answers what does it mean when you say how are you to somebody and they say fine does it mean anything no what it means is hi back to you It doesn't mean anything at all. It's social, it's pleasant, and it's nice, but it doesn't mean that I'm really fine. So those are good things, but we have to get beyond those things if we want to have biblical fellowship. So we need to be looking for people who are interested in that, not just waiting around and hoping that someone pulls it out of us. It usually doesn't happen by accident. Sometimes it does, and that's nice, but it usually doesn't. I was at the community center the other day, and I ran into a guy that I'd known gosh, six, seven years ago, and he was, I was walking around the track because I'm, my knee hurts, so I can't run. Um, I promise it's not because I'm lazy. And I hadn't seen him, for, we weren't close. We, it, the times that we had known each other, it was barely more than social pleasantries. And he came up to me and we, hi, how are you? Oh, fine. How are the kids? Great. Everything's great, great, great. But then something happened, and in just a few seconds, we were starting to talk about what it means to have a teenager and the struggles of raising a godly teenager and how difficult that can be and uh, uh, what it means to be connected. I mean, deep things out of the blue. I didn't expect it. I wasn't planning for it, but it's nice when it happens. It was really nice. It was special, but it doesn't always just randomly happen but like that we need to be looking for people there are people who want to have fellowship with you and we need to be looking for them also same point not by accident don't wait until older and wiser christians invite you into the secret inner circle of fellowship okay i spent a lot of years waiting for people to pull me into their deep uh, fellowship and the truth is just because someone's older and just because they're wiser doesn't necessarily mean that they have fellowship either. So don't wait for someone else to pull you along. Be looking for people to, to have fellowship with. We should pray. We should ask God to bring those people into our lives. And we should act. We should ask God by the power of the Holy Spirit to bring along those who aren't yet ready to have meaningful fellowship. So the first thing is, it usually doesn't happen by accident. God does it, but we need to be on the lookout to see what God's doing. And when God brings us an opportunity for, for fellowship, we need to be able to take it. The second thing is, we need to become the kind of people 
that are safe to have fellowship with. We need to be safe people. What does that mean? One thing it means is we need to be non-judgmental people. Now, that word non-judgmental has a few different meanings, some of which are not true, that get tossed around in the world today. There is such a thing as right or wrong. Sometimes we need someone to kick us in the pants and say, like I said, stop doing that. So when I say non-judgmental, I don't mean that people should, in fellowship, should ignore each other's faults, pretend like they don't happen, or even pat ourselves on the back for the, the things that we did that were ungodly. But it does mean that when someone shares a sin or a temptation, that we don't act like no one else has ever struggled with that before. Big open wide, my gosh, I'll pray for you. Uh, We need to remember that we're sinners too. And sometimes as Christians, we have a select category of sins that we treat as super serious. And then others that are kind of, if not okay, that we just don't spend a lot of time talking about. So we shouldn't ignore the former, but we should recognize the latter in ourselves. And when someone shares a weakness or a temptation with us, we need to be encouraging to them. I had to look up a word in the dictionary. The second thing about being safe is being non-platitudinous. A platitude is something that's true and it's wise but it can be very, very shallow when it's used in the wrong way. Sometimes they're not true also. Sometimes platitudes are not true. Have you ever told someone a problem and they were like, oh, I'm sure everything will be fine. I'm sure it'll all work out. It'll be okay. Yeah, every, every, everything's going to be fine. The reality is God hasn't promised everything's going to be fine. And in the world that we experience, things aren't always fine. So it's a false reassurance. And anyone who thinks through it is not really going to be comforted by that because we know Probably it will be okay, but it's not guaranteed. But sometimes platitudes can be true and important, but if they're used in the wrong way, they can come across as very shallow. You know, the God... um, Oh gosh, where was it? Not that. Oh gosh, I cannot think of the phrase I was going to use. You know the idea that God will take everything that's bad and make something good out of it. Is there a phrase for that? I know there's a scripture, God works all things to... Okay, well, you got what I'm talking about. That's true, isn't it? God can take terrible things and make beautiful things out of them. He can take the difficulties and the tragedies we're experiencing in life and make beauty, edification. He, he He can bring glory to himself through those things and he can teach us and honestly that's one of the most important scriptural truths but when someone's going through something difficult when we say god will work it all out or god will bring something good for it by itself it may not be some kind of super meaningful comfort sometimes we can use very very true scriptural verses in a very very cold and callous way So we need to be non-platitudinous people, people who don't just spout platitudes and move on. Thirdly, when we're in godly fellowship, we need to be inadequate people. Now, we are inadequate people, but we need to recognize our inadequacy. When someone comes to you and they, they share something that's difficult, you don't have the answer. You might think you do, but you don't. There's only one person who has the answer, and who is that? God, when someone comes to us with a problem or to share something with, a struggle, he's the only one who can do miraculous things. And do you want ordinary things to happen in that person's life, or do you want miraculous things to happen in that person's life? Do you want their problems to go go away, or do you want something special and amazing to happen? Because God is the only one who can do that. So when people come to us and you're wringing your hands and think, I don't know what to say, and I don't know what to do, that's okay. That's the starting point of good fellowship. We need to recognize that we're inadequate to provide for each other's needs, and we need to look to God to do those things. In 2D, we need to be open people. If you want to be the kind of people that 
are open to good biblical fellowship, we need to be open and we need to be transparent. That doesn't mean that you have to share all of your weaknesses and failings with everyone. We're not going to come up one by one on a Sunday morning and tell us all the things we confessed this week because we'd be here for the rest of the week probably. But you do need to have, we do need to take risks. We do need to take risks. And sometimes that means being the only one in a group that does that. Sometimes it means being the first one in a group that does that. And sometimes it's lonely because sometimes you share and nobody else does. It stinks, but that's okay. Those people just may not be ready for fellowship. Maybe what you're doing and sharing with them is part of God's process of bringing those people along. But we need to be safe people. We need to be non-judgmental, non-platitudinous. We need to be broken and inadequate and recognize that. And we need to be open and vulnerable. So I said it doesn't happen by accident. And we have to be the kind of people that are open to fellowship. The third thing I want to say is, and last, is that for biblical fellowship to happen, we need to spend time together. Do you remember the expression, it's not quantity it's quality time have you heard that before it was really directed mostly towards parents i think a lot of it was directed towards divorced parents who have a difficulty spending as much time with their kids as they would like and it was intended to reassure and it, it, the the saying went well as long as you make the times you spend with your kids meaningful it doesn't matter how much time you spend with them and it's not just for divorced families, it's for busy parents too. It's probably a good warning to myself, people who have lots of jobs, things like that. The truth is quality of course matters, but quantity matters too. And very often you don't get quality without quantity. You know when you're spending time with your kids, you decide today's going to be a special day and everything's going to be really meaningful and we're really going to enjoy it and kids just don't always cooperate. Things just happen sometimes. So we can't always manufacture quality time. Sometimes it just happens and to get that we need to be spending quantity time too. Now I'm not saying that to make you parents feel guilty because uh, there's a limit at beyond a point at which your kids are going to be okay. So it's okay to do things. It's okay to spend some time without your kids. But my point is, quantity does matter, not just with your relationships with your kids, but relationships within the body of Christ. So I'd encourage you guys to spend time together, and I know a lot of you do, not just on a Sunday morning. Charles Haddon Spurgeon the great preacher once said, Satan always hates Christian fellowship. It's his policy to keep Christians apart. Anything which can divide saints from one another, he delights in. He attaches far more importance to godly intercourse than we do. Since union is strength, he does his best to promote separation. So brothers and sisters, if we want not just to end up in heaven someday, which is a good thing by itself. But if we want to do God's work in this world, and if we want to be the people in this world that God has created us to be, if we want to have genuine fulfillment in moving through life in the paths that he's created us to thrive in, then we need to have a life together. So who do you have fellowship with? It's a rhetorical question. You don't have to raise your hand. Do you have people? Let me encourage you that if you don't, there are people here in this church who want to have fellowship with you. Hudson Taylor, the missionary to China, he wrote a book called Union and Communion. And part of what he meant there, he was talking about the relationship of Christians to God. And when he talked about communion, he was talking about the day-to-day -day life that we experience with God. Is that always, is our relationship with God always great? Now, sometimes it's up, sometimes it's down. Sometimes we're close to him, sometimes we're far from him. He's never far from us, but sometimes we wander. That hymn, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. So he used communion to talk about that relationship. A relationship that's harmed when we sin and it's healed when we forgive. But when he spoke of union, he was talking about that unchangeable 
unbreakable connection to God that we have that began when we first put our faith in Christ Jesus and will never, ever end. Our walk with God sometimes has its ups and downs, but that union is never, ever broken. So if there's anybody here today that doesn't have that union with Christ, let me invite you to do that.